still on this uh, uh, lecture 5-2, sketching the root locus. And there's a little bit, I want to back up just a hair on the sketching discussion uh, from where we were, because I remember I was like, oh, I, like a visual would really help here. So I'm, I'm going to go back over the entirety of rule four, okay? So just to, you know, refresh our memories here, we're sketching the root locus by hand because we want to get a feel for how uh, open loop pole and zero location affects uh, uh, what the root locus looks like. And remember what the root locus is, right? It's the location of closed loop poles for different gain values for the controller, right? So if you have different values of gain, the closed loop poles will be at some location on the root locus. So uh, what I included in this, uh, uh, this is the pizzazz that I added right here. This is the pizzazz. There's a lot of Z's and A in there. Piz. I think that it, is that how you spell pizzazz? Should have checked. I feel like there are, are the double Z's at the end? I don't know. You just spell pizza. Pizzazz. I don't know. Anyways, let's, let's move on. Uh, spelling pizzazz is not the point of this lecture, <laughs> believe it or not. So, uh, but we're going to use this, this figure, which is actually a root locus uh, uh, plot. So we've got our open loop poles, the three of them here. So negative 10 and 5, uh, J5, and then negative 10 and, and negative J5. Those are two of them. So a complex conjugate pair. There's one real uh, open loop pole at negative 5, and then one real open loop zero at negative 15. So remember, these are our starting and ending points for the root locus. And then we're going to be drawing these branches by varying the gain and seeing where these closed loop poles go. So the closed loop poles are always going to start at these open loop poles, and they're going to approach these open loop zeros. So for instance, as you increase the gain, you start at this open loop pole for the closed loop pole associated with it, and it just moves leftward as you increase the gain from zero to infinity. It finally approaches this open loop zero. So that's one of the branches of the root locus, and the other two are these. We'll learn a little bit more about how to construct this in, in these last couple of rules. But the rule that we were really it's hard to parse last time. So the first three were pretty straightforward, right? They start at k, at k equals zero, they start at the open loop poles. K as k approaches infinity, they go to the open loop zeros. Rule two was the number of branches of the root locus is equal to the number of closed loop poles. So in this case, there are three closed loop poles. And so this is one branch, this is another branch, and this is a third branch. So those are the, the open loop. Uh, or, or the, the, the closed loop pole locations for different gains. And then rule three is the root locus is symmetric about the real axis. Of course, that's the case in this example as well. So those are the first three rules. The fourth rule, I promise when we apply it, it's not that bad, but it was a little hard to explain without a figure last time. So I think it'll be, go a little easier this time. So um, the rule says, on the real axis, there is locus wherever an odd number of open loop zeros and poles are on the real axis to the right, and no locus elsewhere. So if you just take that as you know, the rule, you come down here and you say, OK, if you wanted to look at this location there on the real axis, it does not have locus because if you look to the right of it, Zero is an even number. Look to the right of it, you have an even number of poles and zeros, which is to say zero open loop poles and zeros to the right of it. If you were to move over here, however, to the right of it on the real axis, you have one, which is an odd number of poles and zeros to the right. Therefore, there is locus at this point. It's true for everything along here. Notice this only applies to poles and zeros on the axis, open loop poles and zeros on the real axis. So when we cross over, we, we continue from this point 
odd number, odd number, odd number. At negative 10, there are two poles, right? But I mean, you could say, oh, well, there's two of them. So it, as it goes into three, which is uh, uh, odd, but we don't even need to look at them because they're off the axis. The rule is only applying to those that are on the axis. Turns out it would work anyways because whenever they're off the axis, they're in a pair. So it's going to just add two. And if you continue leftward, this is still true. Only one polar zero is to the right. All the way up until you hit this zero. At that point, though, when you cross over, if you looked at a point here, there's an even number to the right. Therefore, there's no locus there. So that's, the, that's that rule. Now, we're gonna try to, I'm going to try to justify that rule with the text and then draw in some stuff. Okay, so let's, let's do that. So this is a consequence of the phase criterion. Um, which is the equation 5, 6 from the previous lecture. So uh, uh, that says that the angle KGH um, is equal to pi plus 2 pi minus 2 pi, etc. So pi uh, uh, mod 2 pi, right? Um, the phase criterion states that. Uh, oh, first, recall from that complex math uh, uh, lecture on Monday, the geometric evaluation of transfer functions. Remember, that if you want to evaluate a transfer function at a point, you can think of taking all the poles and zeros in that transfer function and drawing vectors from each of them to the point you want to plug in, right? And the magnitude is equal to the product of all of the magnitudes of the pole lengths divided by the product of all the, of the yeah, of zero lengths divided by the product of all of the pole lengths. And the phase is just the sum of all of the pole fa uh, angles minus the sum of all of the, the zero vector angles. Remember that? We, we went through that whole thing of how you geometrically evaluate the transfer function. So we're going to do that. We're going to think like that in this, in this part. So uh, the, the phase criteria states that for locus, um, this angle must always be pi or its equivalent, so plus 2 pi, etc. So for a test point psi, so some psi we're going to place somewhere in the complex plane. We're just going to place it in there instead of s, somewhere in the s plane, we're going to say a specific test point psi. The sum of the angles from each of the open loop poles and zeros to psi must be pi or its equivalent, as can be illustrated in figure. 5, 2. So, this is true for a point that's off the axis, too. It's true for any point anywhere, because it's the phase criterion. It always has to be satisfied. It's a, it's, it's a necessary and sufficient condition for locus. So, we know, because I already drew the locus on this, that this point doesn't have locus, right? But, let's look at that from a, this geometric perspective. Let's call this psi for a minute. This will be our... Uh, uh, our test point psi. If we were to draw vectors from each of these open loop poles and zeros to that point, and we were to look at these, these angles, and this one's really small, but Um, if we look at those angles, we were to add up uh, all of the zero ones, this would be plus, and then the pole ones would all be minus. We know because this is, doesn't have locus that it can't add up to pi, right? But you could go the other way too, right? You could say, because uh, it's necessary and sufficient, so you can go from, from one back too. So you could say, okay, if you add up the angles and it's not equal to pi, it doesn't have locus, right? So that's our that's our uh, 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 interpretation here. We need when we plug in our psi point here, it has to the angles have to add up to pi. Otherwise, it doesn't have locus, or add up to pi plus two pi or plus four pi or whatever. Okay. So if we are specifically concerned about those that are on the axis. 
um, it gets even easier. So say psi was a point, let's make our test point right here. If that was our psi, then I'm first going to prove to you or demonstrate to you that off axis pole pairs and zero pairs have no net effect. Okay, I tried to do that in a little sidebar last time, but it wasn't, I don't think it was very clear. Um, so what we want to look at here is that this angle is equal and opposite this angle. Okay, so you would be like adding 30 degrees and subtracting 30 degrees. And that's true of anything that's on this real axis. It's always going to be symmetric. So any complex conjugate polar zero pair that's off axis it has no effect on uh, uh, the angle criterion. Okay, so uh, these these off axis pairs have no effect on the, uh, on the locus on the axis because they just cancel each other out. So we're trying to construct a, a sort of rule for on axis stuff. So we know that we can just disregard the ones off axis for stuff on the real axis, the locus on the real axis, poles off the real axis, and zeros off the real axis cancel each other in terms of effect. But on the axis, only, only this and this have any, any uh, uh, net effect that doesn't cancel. So the, what is the angle between uh, this pole and this test point? Zero. What's the angle between this zero and this test point? Zero. So you add them up. Well, actually, you subtract them, right? Because the zero one's going to be plus, and the, and the pole one's going to be minus. So zero minus zero is zero. And we have an even, uh, 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 well, if we have zero, that's not equal to pi, right? So over here, we would say, Zero is zero is uh, not equal to pi. So therefore, no locus. In this region, what happens? What happens to our uh, uh, angle criterion? That what is the angle between this pole and this point? So it's that, right? So it's, so it's always from the positive, so it's pi, right? 180 degrees. So it's pi, and then this one's still zero, right? So we have pi plus zero is pi. So in this one we say pi is equal to pi. Therefore, locus. And then out here, we go, we cross over a zero, and we get pi still from this, uh, from the pole to here. We still have pi, and then we also have pi from the zero. So we have pi, so we have pi minus pi, and we get zero, not equal to pi. Therefore. No locus. And that is, the whole real axis is going to act like that. And you might think, okay, does it matter if the pole happens first or the zero? Well, because pi and negative pi are the same, right? Um, they're both denoting this leftward direction. Uh, it doesn't matter which comes first. It just so happened we had a pole then a zero. You know, a zero then a pole. It's still pi or negative pi, and, and that's equivalent. So that is what, what, what that boils down to then is the simple rule. If you are, look at the real axis, you just start at the rightmost. If you start right of everything, there's no locus. And you start moving leftward, you just toggle locus, no locus, locus, no locus as you hop over these, these poles and zeros. So. We'll, we'll get to that, we'll boil that down a little bit more, but this was just a general rule that we were able to identify, rule four. Okay.
Rule five, the missing poles and zeros are paired with infinite zeros and poles asymptotically. So an open loop transfer function with a different number of poles and zeros is said to have missing poles or zeros, right? So we said, uh, I think we had like a simple example of like s plus one divided by s plus two times s plus three or something. There's an extra pole here compared to the zeros, right? There's one more pole than zeros. So we would say there's a missing zero. This is very common, right? Most of the time, the numerator doesn't have as high of an order polynomial as the denominator. Um, so that does happen. Uh, so for these systems, the root locus begins or ends at poles or zeros at infinity, we call them. So we would call this a zero at infinity because it's missing a zero, right? We'd say there's this fake zero at infinity. For a system with more poles than zeros, which is quite common, some poles approach zero at infinity asymptotically, which is the, this case here. Um, conversely, for a system with more zeros than poles, which is uncommon, it's called a non-causal system. Um, so it's not a physically realizable system, but you can, you can simulate them because you have to have access to future time, um, but in simulation you can have access to future time, so it's pretty sweet. But anyways, it's a whole thing. We don't need to go there. Uh, non-causal systems. Um, uh, some branches of the root locus begin asymptotically from zeros at infinity, which we won't need to really worry about because we aren't going to deal with non-causal systems in this class. Asymptotes originate at a single real axis intercept, sigma A, which can be shown to be related to the finite poles, pi and zero zj, with number of poles and p and number of zeros and z, as follows. So coming back to this example here, we had three open loop poles, right, which is where our locus started, and then we had one open loop zero. How many, how many zeros do we have at infinity? Two. Two zeros at infinity, because we, we have one finite zero, but these other two poles, the open loop poles, need to be matched up with zeros, right? They go to zeros. But in this case, they have to go to zeros at infinity because there are no real zeros. There are no finite zeros. So that's what they're doing here. They're going off asymptotically, but they never stop, right? So they're just like, is it ACDC? Once you start them up. Anyways. Is it ACDC? Am I right about that? My wife is like the dad music person. She like knows all of it. So she's like my reference. I'm like, who sings that song? And she's like, Bon Jovi. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. I have a really embarrassing story about her. Should I tell it? <laughs> well, I don't even know if it's embarrassing, but it's about that dad music thing. Do you know what her favorite song was growing up? Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. That was her favorite song. <laughs> she was like, she was like, this, that was like her first CD, I think, when she was a little kid. It's pretty funny. Anyways, I always make fun of her for this. I mean, I was like a like homeschooled nerd, so like, I really can't, like, I have way more embarrassing. Like, my first CD was probably like. Cindy Lauper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, not even close. It was probably like Veggie Tales or something. Yeah. yeah. Maybe like maybe like Christian rap CD, something like that. So yeah. Uh, uh, anyways, you guys, anybody, anybody, Carmen fans out there? No, nobody even knows that. That was my first concert, Carmen. He was a pretty cool dude. He was pretty cool. Um, yeah, anyways, enough about me. So, we're going to come back to uh, our missing poles and zeros situation. So, what we're saying is that these missing 
zeros especially at infinity that we're going we're gonna to approach with these closed loop poles as we increase the gain, um, they follow asymptotes that we can construct with pretty simple rules. So these asymptotes are like, just by eyeballing this figure here, um, we might say that an asymptote is like this, right? So this one's approaching an asymptote at infinity there. This one's approaching an asymptote at infinity that direction. So we can, we want to know where these asymptotes are. We don't have a location for the zero to draw to sketch our, our root locus going towards, but we can um, at least find the asymptotes pretty, pretty easily. So finding the asymptotes is really all about finding the real axis intercept and then finding the angles that it goes out at. Okay, so in this case, we have a real axis intercept of like, I, I'm just eyeballing this, like negative six approximately. Um, and we have uh, uh, angles of pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, right? So this is one of the angles, and then this is the other angle. So each pole has its own asymptote. So this would be considered two asymptotes, one that goes up and then one that goes down. Okay. All right. Here we go. So this is how we do the uh, root locus asymptote real axis intercept. So to find the real axis intercept, which we will call sigma a, we simply need to take a big fraction. So in the numerator of this fraction, we have two sums. The sum over all of the pole locations minus the sum of all of the zero, oh, maybe I'll use j because there are a different number of them. Sum uh, over all of the zeros. I probably should have used k or something because we like using j for imaginary, but it's an index in this formula np minus nz. So this is kind of like, it's like an average, right? It's kind of like you're doing, uh, you're trying to find the, you're trying to find the center of mass of a bunch of point masses that are together. You're going to find the center of mass of like a, a bunch of point masses and you would do this as your, this would be your calculation. Except that your zeros have like, they're like anti-gravity, like anti-mass, right? So that's, there's a subtle difference there. You, so you sum up the locations and you divide it by the number of them. So it's kind of like an average, but some of them count the opposite that others do. So the poles count positive, the zeros count negative. Now, you might say, well, isn't this going to come out complex in general? Because these you know, poles and zeros could be complex. Um, so no, because the wherever you have the plus, wherever you have the plus imaginary, you have minus imaginary. They always come as conjugate pair, so they always cancel. Um, so you can ignore the imaginary components and just use the real components if you want uh, in this calculation. They always can't. The imaginary components always cancel, so you can just assume that that's going to happen. Um, yeah. So if you came up here. We would be like, okay, our, our open loop poles, we've got uh, one at negative, what was it, negative six before I drew all over it? <laughs> negative five. Okay, one at negative five. Uh, there's uh, two at negative ten. So negative five minus ten is negative fifteen. Minus ten, negative twenty-five. And then you have to say plus... Uh, 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 or minus negative 15 or plus 15, which would bring us back to negative 10, right? So, in fact, I... Uh, uh, and then we have to divide it by the number of poles, so it's a negative 10, divided by the number of poles, which is 3, right? Minus 1, 0 is 2. So... We have 10 divided by 2, which is 
five. So I was a little bit off on my asymptote. It should have been at five. So that's, that's how we know where sigma A is. Now we need to know what the angles are, okay? So that's what this is for. So each ray of these asymptotes is, uh, originates at sigma A, and all that remains undetermined is the angle of each ray, which can be shown to be as follows for all integers m. So sigma m is equal to 2m plus 1 pi. So it's like pi plus 2 pi, plus or minus 2 pi, 4 pi, etc. Um, divided by np number of poles minus the number of zeros. So in this little sketching example that we have up there, uh, it, we have, so say we just, let's, let's set, so this just re repeats itself, right? So as you increase, so m equals zero, so I just plug in m equals zero, m equals one, m equals two, until I start repeating. We go around the circle completely. So when m equals zero, we have pi divided by, in our example above, we had three poles and one zero, so divided by three minus one is two, so you have pi over two is the first angle. So that is that angle, right? That's pi over two. And then we plug in m equals one, and we get two times one, plus one is three pi over two, which is that angle, Woo, all the way around, three pi over two. And then if you did it again, if you did m equals two, then you're gonna get uh, 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 this nine, like pi over two again, but you, you keep repeating the same one over and over again if you keep increasing m. So once you repeat it once, you're good. You don't need to keep going. So we could plug in m equals 2, and we're going to get 5 pi over 2, but that's e equivalent to pi over 2 because we're not worried about how many times you've gone around the loop. OK, so that is how to find those asymptote angles. Now, now those rules, there are more rules. So if you, if you look up in Nice textbook, there are several more rules. Uh, and they're pretty, pretty fun. Um, uh, like they'll tell you things like, what is the angle of departure here of this uh, uh, locus? So like, we know where they start here. We know where there's a locus on this axis. So at this point, if we just used all the rules, we would know it starts here. It approaches infinity there. We don't know what angle it departs at. You can compute that. So you can compute that this is angle of trajectory here is zero. But remember, we're just trying to get a qualitative feel by using these sketch construction rules. We're not trying to do a really precise graph. So I, that's why if you want to refine the sketch, you can look up the rules in Nice and you can do that. But I think it's of diminishing value the more and more precise you go from here. So this is, this is, these are the rules that I expect you to be able to use. The other, other, beyond that, I wouldn't expect. Okay. So, every root locus with k greater than zero will satisfy the above rules. They will help us construct sketches with the following procedure. So, these rules must always be obeyed, but that doesn't mean we want to always have to go back to them. Here's a procedure for constructing it with the sketch. Rule one, I always start with sketching the open loop poles and zeros because according to rule one above, the, the, um, the root locus starts at the open loop poles and ends at the open loop zeros. So um, we start by sketching that open loop poles and zero plot because we know those are the starting and end points. And then, so root locus procedure number two, RL2, sketch real axis locus in accordance with rule four. So remember rule four was the one where we made this argument about odd number to the right, and then you have locus or no locus. And the way that I recommend doing this is 
and this is what the procedure says to do, start right of all poles and zeros on the real axis, and you know no locus is there. As you move leftward, toggle between locus and no locus every time you cross a pole or a zero. So no locus always to start. We find our first pole or zero, we switch to locus. And then we find our next one, we switch to no locus. And then there's no more on the axis, so there's no locus for the rest of the axis. Um, so that rule is pretty easy. We can always go straight to that. That one's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. And then uh, the third step in the procedure is, if applicable, determine poles or zeros at infinity and draw asymptotes. So determine the number of finite poles, NP, and the number of finite zeros, NZ. Compute NP minus NZ. If there are more poles than zeros, and N is greater, big N is greater than zero, there are N zeros at infinity. If N is less than zero, there are N poles at infinity. If N is zero, there are neither uh, poles nor zeros at infinity, and the rest of this step should be skipped. So if there's an equal number of poles and zeros, there are none at infinity, so you're good. Uh, but if there are poles or zeros at infinity, compute the asymptote real axis intercept, sigma a, from equation 5, 7, so from this guy here. And then uh, uh, compute the angles, asymptote angles, from equation 5, 8, so this one there. And then sketch the asymptotes. Finally, the last step in the procedure is to finish the root locus sketch respecting all rules. Typically, a qualitatively accurate sketch can now be constructed, which is our goal. There are certain weird situations where it's hard to construct it just with these rules, like there's a little bit of ambiguity about where things go, but it's, it's rare enough that you don't need to worry about it. Um, if, you, if you are confused or you're not sure, that's a great time to, to go to MATLAB and, and see what it looks like. So. Let's do a couple examples. So, sketching the root locus. Sketching the root locus for the transfer function. <clears throat> okay, so this one, we've got a uh, two poles and one zero, right? So, let's draw ourselves just, and we're just like, I, I, you guys are going to get comfortable with this. I know you're not yet, but you guys are going to get to the point where you can look at a transfer function and you can draw the root locus in like 30 seconds. Like it's pretty, it gets pretty good. People, this used to be people's jobs, drawing root locus plots, for real. Um, but they didn't, they didn't have MATLAB then. So we have MATLAB, so we don't worry about too much. Um, but it's pretty cool that somebody used to do this for their job. They didn't know about the engineering or math aspect, like they just learned the rules and they could sketch them. Like NASA employed people to do this. So uh, we have, uh, we start off with our, you know, what's our first step? Sketchy open loop poles and zeros. So this is, we assume our open loop transfer function is just given to us, so we assume this is our open loop transfer function. So. We have one more, zero, uh, one more pole than zero, so we know we're gonna have a zero at infinity. So we look at that, we say, okay, we've got that. Our, actually, our pole and zeros, our uh, poles and zeros are, are obvious from this in the open loop. They're, they're negative one for a zero, um, and they're negative three for one of the poles and negative five for the other one. So then negative three, and then negative five. So there's our open loop uh, situation. And then our closed loop, our locus situation, remember the next rule is to sketch the real axis locus rules by starting way right, moving left, right? We know no locus, no locus, no locus. We hit one, what do we have now? locus all the way to the next polar zero that we hit maybe we'll see so locus all in there right 
And then we hit this pull, and then no more locus, right? Because now there's an even number to the right. No locus. And then we hit this guy, and we go back to locus, right? And it never stops. Like Mick Jagger, I don't know. <laughs> to the left, keeps going. Like Beyonce. Okay, so this is the real axis locus. <laughs> Friday, guys. You gotta cut me some slack on Fridays. Um, by the way, there's a poet speaking on campus this afternoon, 4 o'clock. Supposed to be pretty cool. Harvey Justice Lecture Series. I'm trying to convince Ashley to go with me. We'll see. So, uh, this, is, this is the uh, root locus plot for the real axis only. And so we say, oh, we have a zero at infinity, so we, we should probably compute like where the asymptote origin is and what the angles are. But do we need to do that in this case? No, why don't we need to? It's already done, right? Like we already know this thing goes off to negative infinity, so we're good, we're good. It's never gonna deviate. We know it has to be uh, symmetric and so this is only one missing zero. It's just going to keep going off to negative infinity. We can compute that angle, and I tell, I'll tell you now, I have high confidence that angle will be pi. And then if you did the next value of m, it would be 3, uh, it would be three pi, uh, and then it would be 5 pi, etc. Um, so we're good. We're done. Root locus figured it out. I don't think that was me. Dang it. Okay, so sketching the root locus for one that's a little bit more complicated. So that one was pretty easy, right? It's sort of softball. Here's a little bit more hard, hard of one. Not too hard though. Uh, so we've got we've got a s plus five, and then we've got s squared plus two s plus two in the denominator, and no zeros. So how many zeros at infinity do we have? Mm -hmm. Three zeros at infinity. So let's, uh, let's we, so we know that probably our asymptotes are going to be useful here, but let's first go through our rules in order, right? Let's draw our, let's sketch our, our plot, so I think this is, this is all stable stuff, so an open loop, so we'll do this. Um, and where are, we have no zeros, but we'll sketch where our poles are. So our poles uh, are s equals negative 5. Um, so if I cheat by not having my example for whatever reason. Oh, there it is. Um, checking that. OK. So I just want to get the scale right. So uh, if we have negative 5, we'll put negative 5 there. Um, and then the other two poles show up. What, what is the, um, it's, they're going to be complex, right? Negative 2 plus 2i, negative 2 minus 2i. Uh, yeah, I have negative 1 plus j, yeah. And I so. I did by the 2. Yeah. Great. Uh -huh. So this is our, these are our, our open loop pole locations, right? So our first, our first nice uh, rule, which is like, we start with a win, right? It's nice to start with a win. So we start over here, no locus, we move leftward, oh, we hit a pole finally, locus, and that goes to negative infinity. Good. So that's what the real axis looks like. Real axis is always easy quick win there. And then we want now to f know where these two poles go. These open loop poles, when we start to increase gain k, where do they go? So we need to compute what the real axis intercept is and uh, what the angles are of the uh, uh, asymptotes. So I was going to kind of use this space up here. So we know that sigma a is equal to the sum of, and we can just take the real parts of the poles and zeros because those are the only things that matter, right? The imaginary ones are all going to cancel. So uh, we're going to take negative 1 
negative one and then negative five. And then we have no zeros, right? So that's what we've got for the poles. And we divide it by NP minus zero, uh, which is three minus zero. So we get negative seven thirds, which is two and a third. So our asymptote is gonna be Our asymptote's gonna be like here. That's the origin. That's the place where it, it meets the real axis. And then they're gonna they're, the asymptotes, how many asymptotes do we have? Three, three right? Because corresponding to the three zeros at infinity. Uh, so we've got one asymptote for each of these. We already know that one of the asymptotes is gonna be pi, right? This is gonna have to go left. But the other two, we don't know the angles yet. So we gotta compute them. Uh, so theta A or M, I think I said theta M equals uh, we had our formula here. So two M plus one pi divided by NP plus Z. So we have two M plus one pi divided by three minus zero. So this is equal to uh, two, well, I'm gonna rewrite this as uh, pi over three plus, and then we're gonna have some factor times m, right? It's gonna be two pi over three times m, where m is, the first angle is when m equals zero, right? When m equals zero, we get pi over three as our angle. So, whoops, not up there. Pi over three is our angle, which is 60 degrees, right? So, I don't know, something like this. And then uh, the next one is gonna be plus two pi over three times one, so, that's four pi, uh, well, let's see. Uh, four pi over three, yeah. Is that right? No, that can't be right. Uh, what was that? Then pi, yeah, but what is, why am I not doing that right? So when I have m equals 1, oh, that's pi. That's right. Gotcha. So pi over 3 plus 2 pi over 3. Whoo! 1 third plus 2 thirds. I know. Is equal to pi. Damn, that was hard for some reason. Okay, and then you add another 2 pi over 3, and we get essentially negative pi over 3. And we kind of knew it was going to have to look like this once we saw the first one, because it has to be symmetric about the real axis, right? So we couldn't have had one going off at some weird angle now. It had to be symmetric. So. Boop. Okay. Now we can draw these. And, you know, if there was like a zero here, or like there was some weird stuff happening, like maybe it would be a little bit more ambiguous. But in this case, we can just say, all right, these are gonna go to these asymptotes pretty much directly. They start pretty close to them, so we don't have to worry about it being some like weird path that they take. They're pretty much just gonna go straight off to infinity along these asymptotes. And that is our root locus sketch. Now, before we, before we shut this down, that means that if you increase gain to a certain point, what happens in the closed loop? It goes unstable. So this is a, a situation where the open loop transfer function is stable, but when we close the loop, if we increase the gain too much, it'll go unstable. Finding out which gain that would be is something that we are gonna be concerned with and we'll talk more about. So 
I'm going to do the uh, MATLAB lecture Monday, the discussion of how to do this in MATLAB on Monday. And the rest of the term is just going to be root locus design examples. So we'll have a lot of fun. So for like, essentially through all of the content now, I just need to teach you how to do it in MATLAB. So, so 